next item, Selectman Mark Murby uh, wishes to discuss Board of Selectman policies for residents' inquiries. Uh, right, and I think what we probably are going to do on this, because I originally had intended for you to be able to read what I wrote um, yeah, before I got the just, meeting, I got and you just got it. In. So let me give you the highlights of what prompted this, and then I, I was able to read it before. Okay. I did read it. Uh, so let me give you the highlights of what prompted it, and then I'm going to suggest that you hear what I have to say. You take this, read it over between now and our next meeting, and then we pick the discussion back up. And before I start, Pete, I'm going to I, I am going to apologize in that I'm calling out something that you were involved with, but to be clear, I'm not shooting at you. I'm calling it out as an illustration. Can I make it a, a suggestion, Gus? Sure. Just just that if, if John is just here for dealing with the letter, mm -hmm. sure. um, do we want to just do that so that yeah, he can that'd leave? Be fine. Sure, absolutely. Now that we're kicking you out, John, but I don't know if, how long you want to sit here during this discussion. <laughs> sure, that's it's a little, little bit of... You know. Sure, so if you want to talk about you, the... You, uh, can, you can stay now that he's right. piqued your curiosity. <laughs> you know. then, our, then we'll wait to the end because Bill will be here to the end. You're always our wrap-up speaker. So. <laughs> it's up to the chairman, but I'm just... Sure, yeah, yeah, if, you want to, if you want to do it now. It's about the car show, is it? No. Oh, the road. The road. Okay, the access road. Yeah, sure. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. I sent out a package last week, and hopefully you had a chance to read it, and mostly it was because we have a new selectman who wasn't party to the background of what went on, so I thought I'd get something out, probably a little more detail than I would have done just for the letter, but I guess I wanted you to know what was happening. Uh, so anyway, uh, Steve uh, Nolan, uh, in his role as... Uh, chairman of the Master State Hospital Master Planning Committee has been designated as the point of contact between the town and DCAM on any issues relating to the construction of the permanent uh, access road. So Steve can't be here tonight, so he asked me if I would fill in for him. Uh, tonight's item, basically it's, it's, it's uh, I hesitate to say simply, but I will. So it's simply a letter from, uh, from Steve uh, and it's responding to DCAM's request for an informal position statement from CONCOM on whether or not they have any objections to moving the, lo the road to some of the alternate locations that we've suggested. And we have the letter from CONCOM basically that says they've looked at the maps, they walked the site with John and, and I, and that it's not, um, not within their jurisdiction. So as long as it goes somewhere in the general areas that we, we had suggested it might go, they have no concerns or they would expect DCAM to come back to them if DCAM put the road someplace that did fall within their jurisdiction. So it, again, it's, it's, it took a while to get the letter, uh, mostly because of people's commitments and everything else, but it's just exactly, I think, what we were looking for to get. Uh, so the letter from uh, Steve uh, is basically a cover letter to the CONCOM letter. And uh, because there were so, uh, multiple committees, town committees involved in getting the letter. We have the Master Planning Committee. We have uh, John Thompson uh, on the uh, Building and Grounds Committee. And we have the CONCOM Commission. We thought we'd at least run the letter through the Board of Selectmen for any comments or questions or approval. So that's, that's pretty simple. If you have any questions or uh, anything you'd like to know, I'm you know, happy to answer them. John's here to talk about uh, you know, his feelings about it. Uh, we're pretty much united. In, any questions? Bill, the road routes are still, it's on, they're running over DPR property, right? Yeah, the road basically is, it, I, I mean, I've been repeatedly describing it as a DCAM road on DCAM property or DCR property once it transfers to DCR to a parking lot that's on their property. And Bill, then, why don't you give an explanation of how we got to where we are, just so the people at home that are listening can understand the issue about yeah, sure. the access and try to make the it, new road? Yeah, I'll try to make it concise. Uh, as part of the land disposition agreement, um, we had a, a clause that basically stated that during the construction phase and the remediation of the C&D area, that the town would allow DCAM access uh, through the, the hospital property that we had purchased uh, to go back to the C&D area to finish the construction and to finish the remediation. Uh, but that uh, after 
um, a period of three years that if the town uh, elected, uh, DCAM would put the property, uh, put the road on their property. You know, uh, and what we were hoping, uh, thinking uh, in doing that was that uh, basically you had the, uh, the access road, again, as I said before, uh, on state property going to a state owned uh, recreation area. The uh, DCAM agreed to do that, but the current location that was proposed was on the border of the two properties. So essentially ran down the middle of parcel A2, uh, which would impact the agricultural value of the property, uh, was uh, very close to uh, the uh, vista, the view from uh, the uh, core campus. And uh, the access entrance uh, at Hospital Road essentially would require cutting through a 10-foot bank which would not have the appropriate line of sight uh, for safety reasons. So we basically wrote a letter to, uh, and the selectmen uh, issued, a, sent a letter to DCAM in, I think it was in September of last year, essentially said, yes, uh, as allowed under the uh, land disposition agreement, we'd, we'd like the road built on state property. Uh, however, we would suggest that for several reasons, mostly safety reasons, um, we think the road should be uh, looked at an alternate location should be considered. DCAN came back, said they were willing to do that. They wanted a little more information. Could we suggest some potential areas? Uh, we did. We sent them back a letter that says, here's some uh, possible areas. Uh, DCAN came, came back to us uh, most recently and said, okay, we're, we're, we're anxious actually to sit down and talk about it, but um, since the property is ultimately going to go to the Department of Conservation and Recreation, we'd like to not present DCR with a CONCOM problem. So would you get a, an opinion from uh, CONCOM that it's not in their jurisdiction, essentially, and it's not in a wetlands area, so that we can tell DCR about it? So we've heard unofficially, and John can, uh, can verify this, uh, that they're anxious to get the dis discussion started. They're waiting for this letter so we can have these discussions. And that's pretty much it. And I would just add that it's not just uh, uh, access to the deep, for DCAM to get to the CND area to do the remediation. This is the access to the overlook. This will be the access to the, the overlook. For the public at large. Yes. And the town has made a decision that it, it's probably better for the town's retained property to not have the access go through the town land because we don't know at this point what we're going to be doing with the town right. land so That's that correct. it makes more sense to ask the state to put it, uh, the access on their land. Right. We may eventually have access across the town land to the overlook. In the end, but we actually will. We have a we have a pedestrian access. Well, and we may want vehicular so, access eventually so, too. But, but you know, we, at this point, we don't know because we we don't know possible. what we're doing with the land. So it's possible. Yep. So we're we're exercising our right that was time limited. We had only a certain amount of time to do it, so that we're exercising it to have them build their road. Yep. Um, I don't know if this is pertinent, Bill, but um, I had a email this week about. Uh, the asphalt uh, shavings that were uh, being stockpiled up by the uh, uh, 37 acres, the sledding area. We're, they're actually being used to fix the parking lot across the street at the main campus, and, and they're going to fill in the potholes because we've changed the access. On the roadway. On the roadway, uh, which yeah. I will tell you about before we leave this evening. Yeah, and I know they were talking about doing that, but I wonder if there's any discussion as to the the, where that material would be best done. It, yeah, it's be, not been utilized. considered for, the, for this road, uh, Mike. Yeah, the, yes, uh, yes. the general concept for the road is pretty much the road that we have right. If you look at the parking lot now and the construction yeah. of the parking lot now, I, I believe it's, a, it's a, a stone dust. But we're talking about some kind of stone dust or gravel road or whatever. The actual uh, makeup of the road will, will come out during the engineering discussions mm -hmm. as to what's you know what's best suited for, for the road. But it's not in, envisioned as a paved road. Yeah, and, and I envision us using it for the state road, but in, in terms of where we use that material within the town's land, is filling the potholes on the existing road the best way to address that, especially if we're changing the access uh, road in using it from the access from the other end. I think maybe we should take a look and see if, is that the best place to use that asphalt? Uh, I think, well, we met on site with Maurice the other day, um, and uh, that was his plan, was to do, the, to do the parking lot out front and to 
do the new access road that we're moving to today, our access road for the next six months. Down by the stone yeah. gate entrance. Yeah. So that, that's that what road you're gonna is use pretty rough. For. That's what they're gonna use for. And that those are shavings from when they did the okay. twenty seven reconstruction. No what will be the access to the overlook? Right now? For the next six months? Yeah. Uh, yeah, or per, uh, beyond that. Beyond that is the is the road that, the road that Bill is talking about. From that, okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a vision that there'd be a permanent access uh, on town property to no. the overlook? No. no. Okay. no. That, that no. was no. one no. of the options no. that was originally no. discussed. Right. Um, and it's until the new road is built, it will be, it will be from the existing campus. Yeah. And if they run into construction difficulties or delays or anything else on the other road, I mean, yeah. you know, we're certainly not going to stop DCAM from going back there. They still have a re remediation to complete. And they still have under the um, monitoring and maintenance agreement for the uh, reconstructed hillside, they still have routine inspections and everything else. Yeah, and they, they still have an road. access easement along right. our existing roadway. Right. Okay. So if you have no objections, uh, we'll get the letter out tonight. Uh, thank you. All right. Thank you. That's it. Thank oh, you. Well, while you're here, while you're both here, Chris, do you want to just give them a brief heads up on the insurance? Uh, I'm, I don't have my second bid in yet, so I'm not going to talk about the insurance tonight. I'll move it to our next agenda. Okay. Um, but Chris is looking into trying to get some insurance on the uh, property up there, so we'll have some coverage. Okay, good. So. Um, but, but I will I will talk about the access road uh, quickly. So um, due to the lease we have on the site currently, we're going to change the current vehicle access. So currently you come up to the main gate uh, where the trailers are. Uh, as of tomorrow morning, we're going to close that gate and you won't be able to drive your car through there. If you do want to go take your vehicle through the campus and go to the overlook, we ask that you use the stone gate entrance um, and that will be open tomorrow morning. Um, you can still park in the front lot, that's not a problem, and you can do pedestrian access through, um, but we're asking no vehicle access, and there'll be new barriers through the campus with a new um, traffic pattern through the campus to get through. Does it go around the outside, or? It's around the outside, outside. yeah. Um, Christine, one, one, um, if I might add to that, the road that we're, we're planning to use is called Stonegate Drive, and that, that merges onto what's called Tower Road, and Tower Road is the road that passes the water tower, and so you'll go, you'll merge from Stonegate Drive onto Tower Road, and then you'll take a left on North Street. So North Street is the um, east-west running street on the north side of the campus. That will bring you directly into the parking lot Thanks. that is just east of the Overlook, and it will be two-way traffic. Um, I will spray paint some lines on those roads with a P on it so cars will be able to follow the, the arrows on the ground. Um, one of the suggestions I had from someone that lives on Longmeadow uh, yesterday was that we, we should consider um, sending a quick, maybe a letter out to the folks in that, those neighborhoods that just, because they're gonna see cars um, traveling through there. I'm happy to, to pen a quick letter that goes out to those neighborhoods so when they see cars going up and down um, Tower Road, they'll, they'll know why. Um, there's quite a few folks over in that neighborhood. And sometimes it does get busy, and part of the reason that we wanted to move the access road was as the park has become more popular, um, you have cars going in service road, which is the current entrance, and um, moving pretty quickly um, through the west side of the campus to the Overlook Park. And there's a lot of people you know, pushing baby carriages and dog walkers. And um, you know, one of my concerns is the dog runs out from behind one of the buildings while someone's quickly driving down to the Overlook Park. And I think, I think moving the road will help get it out in the open where it's away from the buildings and sort of over the, um, the topography there so it'll be somewhat hidden. I have walked this access route with John O'Donnell from DCAM as recently as early March, and he thinks it's a good, a good path uh, to move this, this access route. And just a, just a reminder to all of our residents, the campus is sunrise to sunset, dusk to dawn. So, so, so John, would you recommend that we use that revised route for experimentation on speed bump designs or anything like that? <laughs> we may need yeah. to. Um, there are some speed bumps that I've tried. <laughs> you to, missed. You yeah. missed our speed bump conversation <laughs> yeah, earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. Of course, 
Is, is Tower Road the one that goes up next to the fields? Yes. No, that doesn't need speed bumps. Yeah, no, that doesn't. It needs some work, and Bobby's looked at it for Mo. Bobby Kennedy has looked at it. Um, and I think that using the shavings there is really uh, the best place to fix those. They have to, you can't just fill it in. You have to kind of shore it up and then put it in, and they'll hit it with a steamroller. They did a little bit of that for the car show last year. Um, uh, on South South Road, which runs east-west, but on the south side of the campus, and that's held up really well with traffic. So that that makes a good base. Um, we need to use it though, because if you don't use it, um, as the sun bakes it, as the weather gets warmer now, um, that can congeal and get hard. So we need to we need to move it, get it out of there. Uh, what will you do for the auto sh show? Will that will you open up the old entrance to for I think, access yeah, for that? We'll have or a little more you... access there. The way we talked about blocking service road was just with barricades, not a Jersey barrier, so we can still, you know, move open that when we need to. And the car show uh, is on a weekend, so the, um, the film company isn't active on the weekend, so they're okay with, you know, having the, the flow of traffic uh, sort of the same route that it was last year. Okay. Anything more on access roads? Then we're on to the, uh, the car show, John. Okay. It's the, it's the same contract that we had for Charlie Harris last year. Um, it's a one-day license for him to use it. Uh, I believe it's June 25th. Um, he does have a rain date in there, and we do allow him access to the site uh, the day before to start to begin setting things up. And he'll provide me with um, proof of trash removal and a certificate of insurance. So my understanding was that the car show last year made around $30,000 or something profit. Um, and uh, my reaction to that was that if we're renting the land for 2000 that maybe we should think about asking for more than 2000 and asking to participate in the profit in some way since it's our land that enables it to happen. Was there any of that discussion at all? Or? The only discussion I had that he had mentioned to me was the possibility of, of um, an accelerator for a, a three-year contract, mm -hmm. and I don't know if that's the contract that he has signed with the town. Uh, the, uh, this is a one-year contract because I was not sure what our plan is with the State Hospital Committee coming back this fall. I did not want to engage into a three-year contract at this point. And I think we, we did talk about you know adding a little bit more to the cost of that for this year. He, he has to invest a little bit more in, in, um, in dust control this year because last year um, there was quite a bit of dust. It was a very dry, warm, day and um, that was the one complaint that he got and he also I think this year he needs he, he has talked about um, funneling people in a better way from where they uh, park their cars into the actual show so that he can uh, make some of the revenue that he missed last year because he wasn't capturing all that there were people driving in and they were just walking walking onto the grounds so I, th I think if this goes forward in the future Pete that's a possibility that you could talk to him about you know um, a portion of the revenue from the show for the town yeah but you're saying not this year you but don't not this year no. not this year all right I would do it differently but um, so we need a vote to approve it then as it's done with the two thousand dollar payment right and just just remind me Christine um, this is just for the contract, right? Had we, we already approved this. Pretty, pretty back we previous. talked about it uh, a few months ago. I believe we talked about allowing him to do it, and part of our negotiations with the film company was that we would allow this to go forward um, because we had indicated to him that we were in favor of him doing it again this year. Right. I, I thought we had taken a vote to allow him to do it again. I don't think so. Um, I don't know if we got to the vote because we were in discussions with the other company as well. So I don't know if we ever actually got no, to the, a vote. No, if on. the vote had come up, I would have raised the two thousand dollar issue again. It's been not yeah. sufficient in my we mind. Vote on it. We just talked about it. Yeah. yeah, I think I don't think we actually took an official vote. Okay. Well, I mean, Pete, do you want to go back to him with, and, and suggest asking for more? I would. That's that would be my position. But John's saying no. I don't know about Chris. What, what your position? You guys are the ones that have been dealing with him. I mean, the, what triggered it in my mind was hearing that he had made $30,000 last year and that I know that the year before that, I think he'd lost money at Elm Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, it was what I had heard. Yeah, uh, I, I hadn't heard, Pete, that he had made $30,000. I, I, know, I, I know he had 
a lot of agreements with the vendors um, for the show, and I, I, don't, I really don't know how much he, he netted from, from the show. And I don't remember where I heard that figure now. I, I can make a comment uh, regarding Christine's concern about what might happen with the Master Planning Committee and everything else. So they looked at a couple of plans last night, and I'm not saying how they're going to wind up because we don't know what the plans are finally going to look at, but both of the versions that they showed still kept that area in the front open. And they had discussed it open for venues like the car show mm -hmm. or other things. Now, again, I'm not saying that's what, that's what's going to happen, but but right now the two plans that they showed last night show that area being left open. So if you don't get it this year, there's a good shot that at least for the next couple of years it will be there. So you might be able to go back and be more aggressive next year. I mean, I guess I think that if we're going to change the policy on that, then we need to go back to, um, you know, we're allowing the Department of Defense to use the property. I don't know what their government contract is, the, the MIT, uh, call it, um, MIT and the other school that are using it to do their drone testing because I assume that they are making more money on the contract. So if we're going to start asking for that, I don't know, we need to change our policy then. Yeah, I don't think we should change the policy. I mean, Pete had suggested it. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think we've set a policy of $2,000 a day. Um, if someone can write for $2,000 a day and make a million dollars, good for them, right? I mean, so, um, but since Pete's raised it, I, I didn't want to, yep. it's our decision as to whether we enter the Absolutely. contract or not. And so if you want to advocate for asking for more, we should have that discussion. I think we should stick with the rate that we've set, um, which I think is a fair amount um, for a one-day rental. But um, I, I am concerned that we did, and, and it is mainly me, has held Charlie up for the last couple of months because I knew we were negotiating with this other entity. Um, so I feel like we've, you know, going back to him now at the beginning of May when the car show is six weeks away would really... Um, I do. I, do I, I would feel you know, uncomfortable doing that. Well, just by really way of right now. reference, Pete, the um, the show at the Endicott Estate um, is is twenty five hundred for the day. I, I know from another car show promoter um, that that's what they pay for the Endicott Estate, and I think Charlie was paying um, about the same two thousand to twenty five hundred for the day um, over at Elm El Bank, um, and I think the Lars Anderson Museum show is about the same. So it's in the you know, it's in the ballpark. This model of um, uh, part of the receipts isn't used for the other car shows, as far as I know, just by way of reference. No, I, I favor sticking with the 2000. That's been the policy we set for the rental cost for for profit enterprises at the hospital. And so it doesn't bother me if he's successful at it for the day. And I think it's a great event for the town. It's good to have in the town. People enjoyed it, you know. So for as long as that area is um, undeveloped, I think it's a fine, you know, one day use for it. I, I would stick with 2,000. But. And I think that this year, there's no question you have to stick with it uh, given the timing at this point. So, so why don't we just go ahead with the, uh, the vote then to approve it and uh, execute it? All right. I would move to approve and authorize Chairman Peterson to execute the June 25th, 2017 car show contract. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, we've got a uh, uh, pending continued discussion regarding the Fire Chief Selection Committee. Or do you want to go back to Gus's topic? Oh, Gus, know. yeah, sorry. Uh, sure. That's all right. I'll try to keep this short because I think it's probably a longer discussion next week than it is this week. Um, so the, just to set the context on this, I'm the new selectman, so mostly I'm trying to figure out how this works uh, and, and how we operate. Uh, so that's where I started from. Two things happened in the last week and a half. Uh, the first one was the email that came in from Colleen Sullivan in the aftermath of the town meeting asking about the ALS, uh, you know, the way the ALS vote came out, asking about where we were where we were at. And my immediate reaction was to send you a, an email, Pete, and say, well, this letter came in to the Board of Selectmen. Who should respond? And I had I'd made an assumption that this is a message to the Board of Selectmen. There should be a Board of Selectmen response. Open meeting laws don't mean that we all sit there and do everything, but it would be appropriate for response. And then I, I learned that the rules that you've been operating by are each individual selectman just responds directly when those things come in. So one of my issues is I don't think that's the right way to do it personally as one person on the board. Uh, given that the discussion two, two meetings ago, I guess, was that I would 
probably be the selectman representative on the ALS study committee, it particularly seems odd that I'm the one selectman that didn't send a response. And, and I didn't, although I talked to Colleen, and we're, we're, she's, we're okay. So we, she's gotten my feedback directly. Uh, so that was one thing. My, my issue wasn't that you sent the message. My issue was, I don't think that's the smartest policy for the Board of Selectmen. That's the issue I'm raising. The, uh, and, the, and the fundamental issue there is when a communication comes in addressed to all three members of the Board of Selectmen, I would see that as a communication to the Board of Selectmen, not a communication to three people who are on the Board of Selectmen. And, and it's, it's got more to do with not having three selectmen in a vacuum send responses to a citizen on a topic that's under discussion by the board, where that's the only person in town that actually knows how far out of sync we are, mm -hmm. <laughs> which just doesn't make sense to me. So that's, that's one thing I want to put on the table. The second one, and this is the one I'll, I'll apologize only because I'm picking on the, the incident that you were involved no, with, Pete, but that's, that's not my point. When Ron uh, sent the, his message to the Board of Selectmen, you posted it to the blog, the Concerned Citizens picked it up and immediately put it on Facebook, and suddenly a pending item that was a topic for tonight's meeting became a pretty unstructured announcement to the public that in watching the, the back and forth and the comments that went on, at least half the people didn't fully understand the context. So we, we weren't helping people kind of understand what the town was doing, where actually the effect was to, seed, to sow confusion. Uh, and so that's slightly different because that was a topic that was, again, a, a letter to addressed to the Board of Selectmen. Had Ron wanted it to be an open letter to the Board of Selectmen, he could have posted it on patch. But we decided that his letter would be an open letter. And my concern there is that people will hedge the kind of communications that we have with the Board of Selectmen if they're not sure whether that will become a public letter, whether they wanted it to or not. So again, I'm not, I'm not, I suspect both of you will have more opportunities to shoot at me on something I'm going to screw up in this coming year. That's not the point I'm making. The point is, in, the, in someone communicating with the Board of Selectmen as a Board of Selectmen, I, I think that's the way they've chosen to communicate it, at least until we've had a chance to talk about it. Probably that's not something that should just go out there. Having said all that is the context. In here, what you'll see, because I chafe at the muzzling that has effectively gone on with the Board of Selectmen for years, presumably in pursuit of, of, of complying with the open meeting law. So I agree with the objectives of the open meeting law, and I really get worked up when the effect of the open meeting law is to have the exact opposite of what it's intended to do, which is to promote good government. So in this letter, what I proposed, and this I haven't passed it through Mark or anybody else, but what I proposed is I would, rather than thinking about all the things we can't do to communicate, I worked the question the opposite way. I said, well, what would the rule be for what selectmen can do to communicate? So I'm looking for positive guidance rather than this kind of overly defensive negative guidance. What I came up with, and it's just my thoughts for your consideration, is there's two things that as far as I'm concerned, again, not having talked to Mark Sorrell, that selectmen, along with anybody else that's in a, in a town position, should be able to communicate. Points of fact and matters of public record. So the points of fact, when Colleen first called in and said, where were we where will we stand here? My thought was, just repeat that the vote at the town meeting didn't put any provisions in. The plan and the discussion was that we would, you know, we would rely on mutual aid. And if, you know, we don't really have a plan B if that were to fall apart. That's kind of the facts coming out of the, the town meeting. I do think there's provision, there, there should be a provision for a selectman to share an opinion which has already been voiced and is a matter of public record. So if you're in a public meeting and you speak in a public meeting and you, you express your personal opinion, not the, not the opinion of the board, it's not at all clear to me why that opinion entered into the public record is prohibited from being talked about by the open meeting laws by the, by the selectmen. So that's really, it's a very simple proposal in here. It only applies to communications that go to all three selectmen. 
So I'm not, I'm not getting into one-on-ones or even two-on-ones, but only for communications that go to all three selectmen. The spirit of it is not to second-guess anybody. The spirit of it is I'm sitting here struggling with how do I actually deal with communications because I don't like the idea of having to act like a big dummy and keep my mouth closed, as some people who know me well can attest. Um, so I'm trying to look for a positive policy that allows us to stay in compliance with the open meeting law that does allow us to engage more thoroughly and, and responsibly with the public. Uh, when I was running for office, I kept, you know, one of the frequent questions is, what are you going to do about the transparency, lack of transparency? And for the first half of the election cycle, I dismissed that as people that just weren't trying hard enough. I just, you know, I don't have any problem with transparency. I'll call Mike or Christine or I'll call Chief Meany, and, and that's all you have to do, too. But I think I gained, first off, I kept getting asked the same question, so if people keep asking the same question, maybe there's something to it. But as I see things like this happen, it's like, yeah, it is transparent. It's not because anybody's hiding it. It's because we've got our hands so tied because of the way we've chosen to comply with the open meeting law that it comes across like it's not a very transparent government. And I'd like to address that. So it's an idea. I'd like you to look at what I've read. I've tried to explain it uh, in these two, ex two instances, kind of just happened to hit in the same week. So it would get me fired up enough to take and write a three-page document. But I, I think if you read it and reflect on it, you may have some better ideas. You may totally disagree. I wanted to get on the table. So uh, transparency is a big thing for me. I think that it's, I think the government should be as transparent as possible. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I started my blog was that I had found somebody to put out an email newsletter for the town that, that I think Mike didn't want to have happen. And so it didn't happen. The, the man went away. It was, it was uh, Tom Mulvoy who had uh, put out the, had been a journalist for the Globe mm -hmm. for 30 years. Um, and, um, and so that I thought to myself at that point, well, you know, I've been talking about transparency. If, if it's really time for me to take action at that point, because what, what I realized as a selectman is that we see huge amounts of information that the people in town don't know about, unfortunately. And it's, and it's, and so what I've tried to do is when I see the information that I think the people in town would, would want to know about, would be interested in, I try to, I try to put it out for them to see. Um, and, and in the situation with Ron, it was one of those, that was one of those ones that didn't feel exactly right to me. So I actually, called, I actually emailed Ron and asked him if he cared whether I, I put it, because I knew that people would be interested in it. Um, and he told me that he, he didn't mind. And so that I, I went ahead and did it at that point. Um, but so you, so I, I, to respond to that, I think if you did that, and that's what he said, that allays my fear that someone who issues a letter to the Board of Selectmen directly and it has it go public without them intending it to. That, that takes care of my fear that somebody yeah. would have to hedge what they say for fear that we would unilaterally do it. But can I, but can I comment on, because I think your blog, when you put out, part of this, my proposal was statements of fact are absolutely in bounds. So putting information out, which I think is what your blog really does, you know, when certain documents come in or certain plans come in, yeah. Yeah, it's, one of the, it's one of the good ways that people get, a, get access to that. There were two things on the way it was posted that I reacted to because they were editorial. The first was the title, Town Loses Stellar Veterans Agent After Vote. That sounds like, well, because the town voted down the extra money for the veterans agent, Ron Griffin resigned. And that's not the story there. So that was the first one. To split hairs with you, you also said you thought that that vote was the low point of the town meeting. I thought that was one of the high points of the town meeting because we have taxpayers who will not vote money in when there is no good reason for spending it. And when they actually were told, the law says you have to have a full-time veterans agent, and they resoundingly voted against it, my reaction to that is, when the state says jump, these taxpayers don't say how high. They basically say, what for? Does this make sense? And I, you know, it's an opinion, um, but those two things I reacted to because, well, I 
disagreed with those two opinions. And then I'm sitting there, so should I start a blog and put out the counter? And it's like, no, that's not the right answer. So, and, I, and again, I'm not attacking you, Pete. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, talking no, that, about no, the, the dynamic or the impact of Yeah, what. And, and it's, well, let me start by saying, well, let me just respond to those two mm -hmm. things quickly because uh, um, I, I use the word stellar because I, I happen to think that Ron has been absolutely remarkable for the town. He's, he's innovated so much. He's done such a great job for the, for the veterans. I had a woman who, as a selectman, for God knows why she thought I could help her, but she wrote me a letter about her mass health and, and the problem she was having with mass health. And, and I gave it to Ron, and Ron actually fixed it for her because I, I knew that he was the shine counselor, and, and I knew that he knew how to do that, and, and he actually made it happen. When, and I think that it was a series of different people that had failed her um, but he was he mm. was persistent. Uh, um, there was another point that I was going to make about the. Uh, oh well, Ron and and the youth outreach and the Council on Aging had had created this solution that I thought that I happen to think is an excellent solution for the issue um, of their sharing the excess capacity to service the needs of, of, the, uh, of the youth in town and the seniors in town. Mm -hmm. And to me, that made a lot of sense. I lost track of that. That was given to us at some point before the town meeting. Um, a lot of that stuff, the selectmen just never seemed to follow up on. I assumed that that was getting vetted through the, uh, through the, count, through the uh, warrant committee. And, but then the next time I heard of it was when, uh, when Ron addressed it at town meeting and said that it had not been allowed. So. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my, my whole point is I, I wasn't intending to challenge you on the specific merits of what you did. I was trying to, I used it as an illustration of how you've got selectmen yes. that are not operating in a coherent fashion. Yep. Uh, yep. And, 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 that's, and I, that's the reason I raised it. It wasn't to pick on you or anything. It was, and I absolutely agree with your yeah. general concept that, that we should have some sort of process. I think mm -hmm. it makes absolute sense to do that instead of just all three of us responding ad hoc on it each time that it comes up. Um, so you, you guys can look at this and we could, I would just suggest let's pick it up as a follow-up conversation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for doing it. Well, I think I have to say in, in full transparency, Gus wanted you to have this yesterday, but I stopped it because I thought it was a violation of the open meeting law. So Gus and I so, have had some very good conversations today so, about so, that. So in that Chris has brought so, that up, I, um, I did mention that I, if, I wasn't sure, but there is a certain degree of surrealism that we are <laughs> having a discussion around how to comply with the open meeting law and the document that I attempted to send out to support that discussion was blocked because of the yeah, open meeting yeah. law. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I, if I could just make one comment on this, um, and I think um, on the first point, not on the posting of the letter, um, I, I think that, that just one thing to think about is whether the concern in responding to Colleen's email is, is a concern of consistency, mm -hmm. that there's a single response as best we are able from the board to the extent it's communication to the board, or if it's a question of transparency and providing the information the person is looking for. Because I read what you wrote as to be more concerned with the former issue, that, that you not have three separate right. views. Right? I, right. I, I responded right. to Colleen's yep. email um, and I made clear that it was my view. Well, here's my view. We haven't discussed it. Here's my view of how this would go down. Um, and so to me, that kind of response is more transparent because she's getting my view. She knows it's my view, and she'll understand it. Um, if it's going to be a single response solely of factual information and essentially a reference to earlier meetings and minutes, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that, too. I don't, I don't have an objection to it. But I think in thinking about it, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm fine with having an approach to responding to general emails to the board, I'm fine if it just becomes the job of the chairman to respond and say, I'm responding on behalf of the board. Look at our meeting from, go to YouTube and watch our meeting at, on this day we discussed it. Here's what's happened so far. Um, and, and I think, and, and, I, and frankly, I think when I get these kinds of inquiries, 85% of the time, it's really just providing factual information, right? Because there's not, um, uh, short of watching the meetings or reading the minutes, you know, th there's not, you know, there's one newspaper, right? And, and so in the normal place, you would get information like this, and there wouldn't be, um, you know, short of like the Federal Register or the Congressional Record. I mean, you wouldn't have, I don't think most towns would have sort of a you know, transcription of meetings like this. And so you would get it from a newspaper, you'd get it from someplace else. And there's, that just doesn't exist. Um, I mean, the Medfield Press does an excellent job, but you know, 
I think I have 12 articles on this stuff. And um, so a lot of the background and context is, is harder to find. Um, and so can I respond? Two points. Yeah, go right ahead. To your point. Because first off, I, I don't have a problem with the, with three responses going out. The, re, the, the reaction I would have to that is that would be just fine as long as you copy the other selectmen. So if we didn't want to control how many, how many went out, but whoever answered first copied the other two so the other two would know that unless you got something to add here, you don't even have to bother. Which Do I have hives what, yet? Because I have hives. <laughs> which, is, which, is what you, which was what any normal well, organization would Well, Mark would be having a stroke at this moment anyway. Right. So. Right. But, <laughs> but, well, no, but, but, but there is one more point in here in that you've, you've it's Almost as that. dangerous as a speed bump, guys. Yeah, yeah. right there. there is one more point in this, and that's that on a different issue, not on the ALS issue, I have gotten access to both of your private responses oh, to people. So the policy of doing it this way is ineffective. The people didn't send it to me with the intention of letting me see your responses. I didn't go looking for your responses. You didn't send them to say, hey, can you bank shot this to Gus? What it was is that they forwarded, because they were talking to me about the same issue, they forwarded an email chain that was intended to simply, here's what I got from so-and-so, here it is. I happened to go down the chain and look what's five messages down. It's the original individual selectman's mm -hmm. answers. So part of my point here, to, when we get Mark to recover from the first heart attack, is the current policy doesn't work. It's not effective. Right. And so we need a different way to do well, it. Well, but I think, I think, you know, and Gus and I are veterans of, open meeting law debates from our, yes, work, from our work committee <laughs> days. And I don't want to revive that, but I mean, if you read the way the state interprets the law and the way the attorney general interprets the law and the way the law is written, right? I mean, I, it, there's a difference between the selectmen sending each other their views on an issue in a private correspondence and, the, and, and then it sort of ending up with them through some other way, right? I mean, it's, it's not an open meeting law if, um, a member of the Boston City Council gives a speech at the Boston Public Library about an issue facing the Boston City Council of his or her views, and then each of the other 12 members of the Boston City Council reads the Boston Globe summary of that speech. That's not a violation of the open meeting law. Um, substantively, is it a lot different than that counselor sending it? Well, I mean, it's public. Right. Right? If you have right. public communication, other selectmen can read public communications that, that, that are made. The, the issue is the private communication of it. So, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, Gus, mm -hmm. and I think the law would be smarter in a certain sense if you could do it that way, right? If you, if you, if you could do it. But um, it, it's a very slippery slope, and you have, um, you, you have a, an attorney general and occasionally district attorneys who take a very strict view of what the law requires, and, and, and I think we'd probably end up on the wrong side of it if, if the view was, well, you're sending an opinion piece to a constituent and copying the other members of the board. Which uh, is no, precisely why I said just, don't put opinions that are not right, part but, of the public. But, but I think the problem is that it's um, almost impossible, I think, to draw that line because I mean, other than simply we had a meeting on this date and discussed it on that date, Anything you get beyond that, I mean, you know, I, I think of it when I write the summaries of our meetings, right? I don't write, I don't write a transcript of our meetings, right? I, I try to give the gist of what happened. Um, I think everything I write in my summaries is 100% factual. I would describe it as fact. Um, most people probably wouldn't. <laughs> people might have a different impression that some of it's opinion and the rest of it. So I, I'm, I, I think we should discuss this further. Um, I don't think we can go down the route, and, and, and regardless of whether it's, I think it would be better in many ways if we could, but we just can't, I don't think we can go down the route of, of being able to copy each other on those kinds of communication. I just, I just don't think we can do it. I, I think if the idea is we, we, we want to have a consistent response to say the chairman's going to say, okay, so-and-so will respond to your email. Um, and, and so there's only, it would cut down the total amount of work we had to do in the sense yep. that three of us aren't going to be writing Responses, and we can say. And this the one. trigger for that would be the uh, email going to the three members right. of the board. Right. Say so and so will respond, and then, but you do. I don't think we can copy each other on it unless it. I just. I don't think we can do it. I mean, well, I, you, you read what I've written because right. I don't yep. believe there's anything that I propose there that does violate well, the open meeting law. I don't and, know. And would it violate? Open, we will would it violate the open meeting law if I were to send him decisions on this topic? 
<laughs> Historically, so, I mean, so, I mean there are matters there are, of fact <laughs> and <laughs> items of public record. As long as those items of fact are not interpreted. Right. That's, exactly. That's yes. Absolutely correct. You, absolutely you, correct. There's a spin on the facts. So then, one of the things you need to think about is whether or not an email comes into all three of you and it's just looking for fact. Then does it go to Mike or an I to respond? Do you know to the chair? And then that yeah. takes that off your yep. you know, I, your desk yeah, as yeah. well to yeah. respond to the fact that we'll respond for you. It, it does, I, and I we've talked about this extensively yeah. today. It does silence yeah. you. Right. Um, I, and so I'm well. not prepared to tolerate that. Right. I, I'll put that very clear. I got that. That's not why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the irony is this law was written by one of the most uh, one of the least transparent, most secretive organizations in Massachusetts, the Massachusetts legislature. <laughs> but in they're very in, in doing some research today, in the attorney general's office has an open meeting law uh, website dedicated to justice, and they give their um, decisions they've had and the complaints that have been filed, and there are quite a few complaints about email discussions and some mm -hmm. are very intentional and some are more like what you're talking about you inadvertently got cc'd on a message mm -hmm. and, and read things my my solution which is is a violation of the law unfortunately it would be to post all the emails online so that everybody in the community could see them um, and have uh, uh, that format so that and i think if everybody sees it then it's fine but apparently that's violative of the law sure. mr Massaro. But, but doing that constitutes a deliberation outside of a posted Oh, yes, yes. You, no, you can't okay. do it. Maybe you can yeah, post no, the meeting it's open for a year. Violations. <laughs> but I don't think it, I think, you know, who's, who's as written as letters it, to the selectmen and emails to the selectmen. I, I want to make one comment. So I learned early on in the process not to send someone to everybody where I was looking for an opinion or a response. All right. I, where I sent out information stuff to everybody. When I'm looking for, an looking for a response, I send out an individual one. And I've learned over the years that I cannot take that res response that I get and send it to anybody else. But a constituent wants to know, if he sends it to you, he wants to know what you think on it. He doesn't want to wait for a meeting. He doesn't want to wait for three people to, to, to sit here and discuss it in a public forum and then get the consensus opinion back. He wants to know what you stand. Just like when I was fighting for the hospital and I sent a letter to, to, to Senator Kerry and I said, where do you stand on getting this thing fixed? You know, I mean, I didn't want to expect him to have to sit down and take it through 14 people and come up with a consensus or anything else. Whatever you do, please keep in mind that a letter to you or an email to you is looking for a response from you. And even if it's just to say I got it and I can't talk about it or whatever is a satisfactory response. Um, so Bill, to be clear, I'm only talking about messages that go to all three selectmen together. Well, as a, as a message, and I'm saying that's a letter or a message. But now you're talking point. about constituent education as well. I mean, so I had to learn that I can't send something to the three of you or send, send, if Pete responds to me on something, I can't send it to, to, to Mike and say, this is Pete's opinion, or send it to you, Gus, this is, this is what Mike and Pete think. Why do you think anything differently? That, that I can't do that. So you need, I think you need to educate the public as well as to what the constraints are when they send you something. So well, Bill, you can. You're not bound by the open meeting law. Well, I, 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 yeah, I know, but I mean. So I, what I'm getting at is, so you, you don't you need set up to, you need to, to allow that to happen. If you were responding to a constituent, you, wouldn't you not say, "This is my opinion." However, you know, you please don't communicate it to somebody else or whatever. I'm not sure how you phrase it or anything else, but make them aware of what the constraints on or the conditions on your making that that response are. I know I'm not phrasing this properly, but. I, you, you have to keep the line of communications open between what your constituents expect from you. If in, so to your point, if any constituent were to contact me, and they do, I will be happy. I probably tell them more about my opinion than they're looking for. My only issue is when there's a communication that comes into the Board of Selectmen as a group, especially when those issues are ones that will become items on the meeting, and we... So the fact that somebody wants to know what we think, my point is, I would be okay with that if we knew what we all thought, but we actually have a process that leads to one person in town asking a question, getting three, se if, if all three slap and respond, and either says, gee, they have no idea how screwed up they are. They have no clue how far apart they are. And that's not 
actually a useful thing to, for one person to know, and we don't even know you it. You don't have a clue how far apart you are. In an open <laughs> public <laughs> meeting. <laughs> yes, in an open public, and you know, my point here is not to undermine the purpose of the open meeting law. My point is, I've watched selectmen for years look like total imbeciles in meetings. I've asked selectmen questions in open meetings that they should have been able to answer and they sat there mute. I have no intention of doing that. I may be a one-year selectman. I have absolutely no intention of doing that. And it's because I want an open governing system. And it's because I want information to flow. We have legal restrictions. That's fine. I'll deal with those. I'm looking for a way to comply with those legal restrictions in a way that allows us to have coherent communications that doesn't set us up to get cross-threaded. So all I've asked for is keep the communications with the people who send you a letter. So, so with that, far longer discussion than I was looking uh, for. If you read what I have to say, Thank you for come starting on back. the discussion. Uh, I'll just mention finally, Gus, that yes. I, my, my strategy is that when I get that email that comes to two or three of us, I respond just to the person who sent it to me, and I add on. I have a, a keystroke key that I use, and I've got one that says, under the terms of the open meeting law, I have, I'm not responding to my colleagues because I cannot. That's and right. I've, re I've read that on the copy of your email that I've received. And, and, and okay. also, I mean, I'm very curious of what Mike writes about the meetings. I was very curious about what Richard DeSorga wrote about our meetings, but I have not read any of those. I, I specifically avoid them. So when I see something like that, I don't read it because I, I think of the open meeting law, and I don't know what, he, what it might be that it's being said. And so that's just my, my approach because I've heard judges talk about doing it that way. So. You're missing um, some really sterling so stories, Pete. I'll tell I you know. I'm, I'm very curious as to what you say, Mike. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you if he has any good jokes. In there. Okay. <laughs> uh, so then the fire chief selection committee now. Um, uh, just to give you an update, uh, we have a few uh, people who have stepped forward who are interested. I didn't know if you wanted to set a date. I know I did have one person contact me today. They're sending a letter of interest in tonight, but I don't know if you want to set a date for your next meeting to cut off accepting the resumes and actually sure. appoint the committee so that we can move that, that one for forward. Yeah, so our next meeting is May 16th. Do mm -hmm. you want to set a cutoff date of next? Well, the agenda will have to go out next Thursday. I would suggest we would set it out um, a week from today, the 11th. Yeah. I think, and I think, I think we should do so for the other two uh, I was going to ask, too. and we have the those. House Trust and the ALS committee with the idea that we'll appoint them all on the 16th. And if there is anybody who has um, sent requests to you or sent their letter of interest that they would like to be on the committee, if you could just forward those to Evelyn and I, we're just keeping in file, and we'll send those all back to you mm -hmm. in full transparency at the open meeting law. <laughs> <laughs> so, Evelyn, the, I had sent an email I think we were asked the question in the last meeting about who the people were that had expressed an interest. So, in the this is the AL, I'm sorry, this is the ALS study committee. You have a full set. I think you got responses from all of us, maybe, or at least two of us, about people who had expressed to us directly that they were interested. But they have not but submitted have a letter not of interest. Submitted letters. So you don't have any letters at all from well, anybody. Those three people that you. Yeah. Mentioned. Yeah. Okay. No, I, cur I currently only have two letters of interest that have come in. For the ALS committee? For the ALS so, study committee. So there was an email that came today. I have that one. Yeah. yeah. So, so the one thing I would suggest, because, and again, this was my first time through the cycle, so I wasn't probably smart enough to tell them what they needed to do mm -hmm. when they first contacted me, but it might be helpful if we're going to have a deadline, if there's a way to get that message out, that yep. the way you volunteer is you send your name along with highlights of your of your qualifications to Evelyn as the place. And I, now I know to do that, but when I first had those conversations, I didn't. Sure. Uh, so if there's a way to get that published with a clear yeah. deadline for both of those committees, that would be a good thing. And I'll, I'll certainly follow up with the people that contacted me, but I would have done a better job the first pass if I'd realized how it worked. Okay. Next item is the Friends of the Dwight Derby House Request a date revision from May 6th to May 20th for new in town one day liquor license. Same time, 7.30 to 10.30 p.m. at the Dwight Derby House. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. Uh, consent agenda. Licenses and permits. Friends of the Medfield Library is pleased to announce the relocation of their bookstore to the first floor of the library. Grand opening reception is planned for Tuesday, May 30. 
2017, seven to nine. Request is made for a one-day wine permit for May 30. Also request permission to display signs for one week prior to promoting event. And we're just going to do all of these at once, aren't we? Yes. The gazebo players of Medfield will perform their summer production of Merchant, The Merchant of Venice on July 23, 20, 22 and 23. They are very excited to announce a new location for the event, Rocky Woods. Permission is requested to post signs two weeks prior promoting the event. Third, Memorial Day Committee requests parade and discharge of firearm permits for Monday, May 29, 2017. Selectmen are cordially invited to participate in the parade and ceremony. Starts at 9.30 or gather at 9.30. Um, finally, resident Chris McHugh Potts requests permission to post signs advertising the annual Zulu Gallery Art Festival on Saturday, June 10, 2017 for two weeks prior to the event. I move that we approve the license and permits as noted by the chairman on the consent agenda. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then town administrator update. Mike? Uh, yes. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, the water and sewer commitment uh, for the winter reading just came out, and um, I believe you have a copy there. The remarkable thing to me is is if you look at the April 2016 commitment and the April 2017 commitment, and there's a difference between the two of about $1,700 hmm. uh, in spite of rate increases. So it does show that there's some effect from the water van, that it is decreased consumption, but not a lot. Um, and it's a two-edged sword. We need the revenue because we have these capital projects coming down the road. On the other hand, we're trying to discourage people from using water because of the water ban. So, but it's incredible. The overall commitment for water and sewer is $1,700 difference out of, out of a total of $1,218,000. Um, the other thing, um, and this just came in today. It's informational, so I figured it was all right to put it on. Uh, this came from John Nunnery, and I believe he sent copies to you also about the election schedule for the uh, uh, primary and the final election for, for, for state senator to replace uh, Jim Timothy. Um, the primary will be held on September 19th. And the uh, final election will be held on October 17th. So, um, and the other thing I just did for your information, I gave you each a copy of it. This is the debt um, by um, issue. And if you go to the third page of this and look at the bottom, it's probably the quickest way to see where we are. And what I've done is I've done a running balance after you subtract. <coughs> Um, the total each year it tells you what we have left in both principal and interest uh, so right now at the end of fiscal 17 we'll have sixty four million two hundred twenty one thousand two hundred and thirteen dollars principal interest payment outstanding that includes the state hospital land purchased by the way so we're dropping about uh, uh, six, almost seven million a year for the next several years 2035, we have none. Based on this, <laughs> if 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 only, huh? Have to We've hold already your started that long. <laughs> yes. They're already lining up at the gate at, at the gate to, with the new projects. So. Um, but the the good news is, by paying off that much each year, it does drop it down considerably. For example, we've gone at the end of uh, fiscal uh, 16 from. Uh, Seventy-six million dollars at the end of fiscal eighteen will be down to uh, fifty-seven million dollars. So it's uh, it's a drop of, of over twenty million dollars in three years. Mike, is there a place here that has the actual annual payment profile? Yes, uh, it's right above it. Um, is that the grand total debt? The grand total debt, yeah. So if I'm reading this right, from uh, 17 to 18, or it's not a big deal between those two. It's gone down. It'll go down about a hundred thousand. Yes, it would have gone down more this 
past year, but we borrowed the million uh, million five for the field. Okay. Uh, it would have gone down about 200,000. Where it really starts to drop off is 2020, because that's where your school projects come off. Um, and yep. then yep. the several years after that, we have substantial drops. <clears throat> that, I presume, will give us the ability to pick up these new projects that are coming along. Yeah, where I'm coming from is total, total taxes on yes. citizens. Uh, uh, this is bro these categories are broken down the same way as the tax levy sheet to yep. uh, debt exclusion, non-exclusion, and water and sewer enterprise funds. So. Mm. Yeah, you get that million dollar drop between 2023 and 2024. More than a million, a million one. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, it, it isn't quite as good as it seems because about half of the school debt is being paid with school building assistance revenue. Mm -hmm. So if you figure you cut that loss in half to get actually what the savings will be. So yeah. so if yeah. it goes down a million, you're yeah. probably saving around 500000 I got it. Okay. Okay. Okay, if you have any questions on that, just email me. And just on this, this Mike, what, when will we will be on the agenda for the next meeting to vote to put the override on the ballot? Um, yes, we will. The question just got uh, sent to the printer. Um, we've been going back and forth with Bond Council and our council on the wording, and they finally agreed on it, so we'll have that is, on. Is Carol going to recommend June 5th as the date? June 5th is the date, yeah. So we'll have, just have to vote that the next time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the other things that are noted there, Mike, is that Wright Dickinson had resigned uh, from the planning board, apparently. Yes, you need to schedule an election to, uh, but they are recommending normally uh, you schedule the election and then they, uh, you open the floor for nominations and the planning board will nominate someone or people will submit letters. And they're and recommending the appointment of Greg Sullivan, who's an associate, been associate member for a number right. of years. Right. They now, so. they actually interviewed candidates for the associate members. They uh, you don't have any appoint uh, say on the uh, associate members. The planning board appoints them directly. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that Greg has been an associate member for a number. of he years. He has been. Yeah, yeah. He he went from the Warren Committee to the planning board. Is that kind of how associate. the planning board uses the associate member as a? Number and waiting. There's, there's sort of a, yeah, and training, yeah, yeah. Uh, they had four candidates and they had uh, two vacancies, so they picked two of the four after interviews. So uh, if you want to uh, schedule the election for the next meeting, can we do that? Or do we, yeah. And then we'll invite the planning board to attend. And what it is, it's a, the election is, consists of, the three members of the board of selectmen and the four remaining members of the of the planning board, and you uh, uh, open the the uh, floor to nominations. Uh, if there's any, uh, the planning board will nominate Greg Sullivan. If there's any other nominations that are offered, then you close the nominations. You open the election, and it's a roll call vote, um, and it's, so there's seven votes and. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, but it has to be done. I think uh, if we're going to do the do the planning board election at the next meeting, I think you should invite Reg Dickinson in to that meeting to recognize for his 20 years of service on the on the planning board. Yeah, yeah, he's done a tremendous job. He's going to be a big lo loss. Yeah. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is this: you are electing the new member to serve f till the next regular election. So next year you will have, I don't know how many are up for whether it's one or two next year for the three-year term, so then you'll have one up for... I think it's one every year because I think it's a five-year term for the planning board. Oh, that's, that's right. They are five, so it is, you're right. It is one a year. So you'll have one up for a full term, and then you'll have another to finish the remainder of the uh, vacancy. Selectman's reports. Mike? I've been out of the country since our last meeting, so... I have no reports on going on. How are the Medfield uh, relations in Europe? I think they're great. <laughs> you're still on Rome time. You're, 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 no, you're I'm probably a, I'm back on Medfield time. Yeah. And uh, I went to, I, I think we all got invited to the Medfield Responsible Affordable Housing 
reception at the Zula Gallery on Saturday night. I was the one that was lured in by the beer and the food. Uh, but uh, it was it was really fun to meet the people that were in the group. It was a it was a very nice reception. Um, I'm happy to hear that the group in general and I, th I think some of the some of the most active people in the group are retain an interest in helping the town address its broader affordable housing needs even while they remain vigilant to make sure that nobody sneaks back in on that property with uh, a project that they would not like to see there. Uh, of note is the two of you, along with our two state reps, uh, Denise Garlick and Sean Dooley, were all acknowledged in that reception as being very, playing a very important role in uh, helping them succeed in getting the Medfield Meadows project. So uh, you both were called out by name, and uh, I'm sorry that I was just the one there that nodded and waved and said I'd pass the word on to you. So uh, compliments from the group to the two of you. Uh, and then last night, Barbara Gibbs invited me to uh, Lions Club dinner. So uh, I didn't make the affordable, I mean the, uh, the State Hospital Master Planning Committee meeting because I was having a very nice Italian dinner hosted uh, by uh, Basil's and uh, enjoyed that immensely. Uh, met, I probably knew about half the people in the room and didn't know the other half, so it was a pleasure to meet some people that I know have been here longer than I have. Uh, and, you know, clearly it's, a, I think, uh, uh, Russ Hallisey said it's a 70, they, they think they have 70 members, so it's a good sized club, but just listening to the work that they do, uh, it's, it's clear Medfield benefits from service organizations with as much energy and enthusiasm as we have. So. I would mention that uh, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Brent Nelson from that uh, uh, Dale Street neighborhood group, and uh, he because uh, he's on the uh, Medfield Affordable Housing uh, Committee now, and he was saying that they were having a meeting last, I think it was last night, to consider whether or not they were going to be, who they were going to be hiring, or they're, they're actually, I guess they've gotten responses from a couple people to uh, to their RFP, one of whom wants to build the whole Tilden Village expansion for them without charging them. Uh, the other I think one, I think, was going to charge them consulting fees to sort it out and to then put it out to developers at the end, so... It sounded very encouraging that there was some uh, some progress that could happen very quickly there. Um, Tuesday night, I went to uh, uh, hear Ruth, Dr. Ruth Pote speak at the high school, and she's a, a physician from Greenfield who talks about uh, addiction issues, and she really addresses it from the standpoint of the brain chemistry that results in young people having a much greater susceptibility to alcohol and, and drugs uh, until their brains are fully formed when they're 24, 25. And she's just a remarkable speaker. Um, and I was very happy that the uh, superintendent liked her so much that he lined her up to come back and talk to the students at the schools because she talks very well to the kids. There were kids in the, in the room in the auditorium. There was like a back row and so she kept addressing the back row my back row, what do you guys think? <laughs> and she got them all engaged. Uh, so, uh, and it's too bad that, uh, that there, I mean, there were 100 people there, so, but I mean, you know, it would have been nice to see the auditorium filled. And then the last thing is I, I had circulated, uh, I had said to Mike that we, he and I should work out a calendar for the year. I circulated a calendar that I had created, uh, uh, I see a lot of years ago, um, that just kind of, and the, and the goal that I had was to try to put in the things that are important for the budget cycle. And Evelyn has a budget cycle calendar, and I don't know whether mine actually fits with yours, Evelyn, or not. Um, but, and then to try to actually meet, to do the things that I, th that I think that we as a Board of Selectmen would want to do every year, such as establish goals for ourselves. And uh, um, so that, and then also meet with the different town committees. And so that most of the stuff is, uh, when we meet with different committees, is absolutely fluid and flexible and just uh, is thrown in there to get each one on a list, on the list at least in some spots so that we'd meet with them during the year. But I would just ask that you guys take a look at that and, and, and maybe we can all confer with Mike and, and Chris and, and Evelyn and come up with a, a plan for the year of what we want to do and not do. And maybe we can put that on the agenda for the 16th. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I think there's a lot coming up, too. I know I was talking to Jerry McCarty, and he said he's just about finishing up on his 20-year capital budget. Wow, great. So uh, he's got to do that. He's working on the narrative, but he should have that ready shortly. And 
as Bo mentioned earlier, he's going to have his Paper roads program uh, put together. So, and uh, we had a we hit a, a milestone today on the sewer treatment plant solo. We hit 300 megawatts. What? So that's just about a year. Just that uh, was around last May when we put it in. So hmm. that's great. Excellent. I want to raise one other issue, scheduling issue that we have. I think as I read that we have two. Boy Scout Courts of Honor on Saturday. Mm -hmm. That's right. One at one o'clock at the Unitarian Church, one at two o'clock at the UCC. Correct. So I just wanted to thought we could talk about making sure that we have those covered. I'm planning to go to try to go to both of them. Yeah, you know, that's what I was going to try to do. And, and tell the people at the first one that we have to. Yeah. I mean, do you think it will take more than an hour, the first one? The first one is just one person. Right. right? The one at two is three people. They don't. They shouldn't take more than an hour for one. I think I think it's probably about a half. You know, it's it's an hour, but the number probably increases by half an hour for it's each one. one. So yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Troop Eighty Nines is an hour and a half. Uh, but that's the second one. Right. Uh, and we might be okay yeah. coming in a little late yeah. on that one. Too. Well, and what I would propose if that happened is because I've been affiliated with Troop Eighty Nine for the last ten or twelve years. I would leave early on the first one to make sure I was there in time for the second, and then you guys could join me there. And so, okay. Uh, the second one actually was the project out back at Town Hall, landscaping the uh, River Town Hall. Can we adjourn? We're done. Is it really? Okay. <laughs> Move to be adjourned. <laughs> Excellent. Second. <laughs>